Would you join me in prayer? Jesus, we come before you today with humble hearts. You are the one true son of the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. You had every right to have your first coming be that of a show of power and authority to judge all that is wrong in our world. Yet you chose to come as a baby to live among us with the ultimate goal of rescuing your people from a life in bondage to sin. You truly are worthy of all our praise and adoration. Jesus, we thank you for this time of year. As your people, we are reminded of your miraculous birth and amazing life, which ultimately led to your sacrifice on the cross, providing us with the amazing gift of salvation. We confess, though, Lord, that we are often tempted by the sins of this world, specifically that of material comfort or covetousness around the gifts that we hope to receive. Help us, Lord Jesus, to keep our eyes focused on you this Christmas season. Help us to be willing to give to those in need instead of indulging in things that really don't matter. Help us to be willing to stand up for the truth of your gospel when gathering together with family that does not follow you or submit their lives to you. I thank you, Father, for this sermon series we've had on Lordship. I thank you for the growth that you have done in this church and continue to do in helping give us the understanding of needing to submit, to submit our lives fully to you as our Lord and to cast down any idols that we have, any ideas that we have, any lordship over ourselves. May we continue to grow in sanctification of this understanding that if we are not fully submitted to you as Lord, you are not Lord at all. Thank you, Father, for the healing that you are doing in our sister, Debbie Jacobson. We thank you for modern medicine and the tool that it plays in healing, but you, Father, are the one that controls healing. We thank you that she is out of the hospital now, and may you give her body rest and help her to be able to make it back to worship with her family soon. I thank you, Lord, for the time that my brother Hans has invested in preparing for this morning's sermon. I pray that you would be glorified this morning and that you would use this church to go out and boldly stand for you this Christmas season and remind the people what the true reason for the season is. I pray similarly for our sister churches in the area, Salem Heights, Outward, Salem Reformed Baptist. May we partner together as your children to show people your amazing love. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Michael. You can have a seat and open up to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. As residents of the United States of America, we are extremely blessed to know and understand what it is to have a relatively peaceful transition of power anytime a leader changes and comes in to run the government. Every 48 years, what we observe in our country is a bit of a miracle, if you look at history. A man and the government that surrounds him peacefully hands the power that that government holds over to a completely different man and his government. And in some cases, it's men who are diametrically opposed in their ideology. And this is miraculous regardless of which side of the political aisle you are from. Our transition of power, as cloudy as it got in this last election, has historically been a very peaceful one, especially when compared with what the rest of the world experiences. Usually the transition to power in most of the world is more akin to what happened in the United States in the transition of 1860 after the election of Abraham Lincoln. The presidency of James Buchanan was falling apart, Multiple cabinet members were embroiled in legal battles from embezzlement and corruption. Most everyone in the United States did not trust him or his presidency. States in the South were ready to secede because Lincoln won the vote by the smallest margin of victory in presidential history up to that point. And the only reason Lincoln even physically got to Washington, D.C. to run the country was because of a goodwill tour he attempted on a train from his native Illinois. There was concern he wouldn't even make it alive. But the next year, the Civil War began and continued for four of the bloodiest years of casualties that this country has ever known. That is more akin to the transition of power in most of the world. History has shown us that the vast majority of transitions of political and ruling authority is violent, contemptuous, and conflicting. In most cases, warfare happens like the violent coup that our brothers and sisters in Burkina Faso have seen over the last few years. Now, why is this? Why does this happen? Well, because at the heart of human original sin is the desire for power over God and others. It is to become Lord of everything around you. 
Just watch your kids try and fight for control of the TV remote when they're trying to figure out what to watch on Netflix, and you'll see it right there in front of you. Seceding power is not something we normally do as humans. And so men and women, tribes and people groups, battle for this power. Transitions of power throughout history are often very violent. We can even observe this trend as we read the history contained in the Bible. Whether we are looking at the nation's of Daniel that subsequently take power over the world or whether we're looking at the kingdoms within Israel in the historical books, we see that transitions of power are filled with conflict and violence. No human or spiritual creature wants to give up their power once they have found it within their grasp. And this is true even at the level of lordship over our own heart or life. And that is why for many of us in this room, the series we just finished regarding the lordship of our life had some violent and conflictual internal results, didn't it? Many of us in this room, including myself, were cut to the core from God's word, and what was revealed were hearts that are duplicitous in our declaration that Jesus is Lord and King. We realized that we have taken power and authority from Christ, at least we think we have, held it for our own, and as a result, pushed Jesus' reign in our lives aside. And so there has been a violent war waged within the hearts of many in this church over the last few months, and I thank God for that. I think that's wonderful. And this battle continues through even the midst of Advent season, doesn't it? As our eyes look towards Christmas, it is very easy to let our internal lordship reign over Christ. Many of us look to Christmas because this season is a wonderful dopamine generator. The lights The decorations, the music, the memories, the traditions, the presents, the food and drink and social connections. All of these things draw our attention because we have high expectations for Christmas to make us happy. To be clear, I think that uh, the many earthly blessings of lights and beautiful decorations and friends and family and generosity and enjoyment of wonderful food and drink, all of this is great. I think they're gifts from God. But the second they begin to be the focus and the emphasis Or worse yet, the second they become twisted into materialism, gluttony, and so on, then we begin to lose our bearings on what we are celebrating in this redeemed season of Advent. In fact, many of us want this redeemed season of Advent to be so peaceful, so calm, that that's what makes us happy, is finally peace amongst the family, peace at the dinner table, Friends, for the Christian, this season is less about these trappings and more about the celebration of what occurred at the incarnation of Christ. And what occurred then was the moment God became man and entered our world to conquer it and to take his reign over all of creation. This morning, we will be reminded that in, the, in interacting with the news of the birth of Christ, Just as the folks in the story have different responses, our hearts can have different responses to this news of Jesus as Lord as well. In looking at the story of the three wise men from the East coming to worship the Christ child, we will see the true event of Jesus' birth. We will see that it was heaven's invasion of earth to redeem creation and the foreshadow of his eventual enthronement as Lord. And we will get a glimpse of the violence that came from the earthly and demonic kingdoms in response. This morning, what we will see is the three responses to the ruling Lord. Three responses to the ruling Lord. And I think this is an amazing tie into what we've been studying for the last few months because these responses are responses with which we can identify. Our hearts at various seasons in our lives have responded with similar violence to the declaration that Jesus is Lord and that he has come to rule over us as king, similarly to what we will see in the story today. And so in this Advent season, we can pause to examine our hearts and bring them before the Lord in worship and refocus our minds and hearts and lives upon Jesus Christ as Lord. For it was in his incarnation that he came into the darkness, invading our world to bring hope mercy, and grace. And that is what we as Christians focus on and celebrate at Christmas. Amen? Amen. So let's begin by reading Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12 this morning. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. 
Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. The first thing that we see this morning in the very first verses is the intro to the rest of this section, which is the collision of two kingdoms. The collision of two kingdoms. Many of us are used to this story. It is one that is often referenced around the holidays and used in connection with the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. In actuality, it happens a good deal later than the day in which Mary gave birth in a stable outside the inn. And so, as a scripture nerd myself, I twitch a little bit every time I walk past a nativity scene, including my own in my own home, where the wise men are presenting their gifts to the baby Jesus as he lay in the manger. They were not the same event. But now that I've had that out of my system, <laughs> we must realize that this story carries immense weight because it does give great commentary on what actually occurred on that first birthday of our Lord. So let's break down just these first verses again. Look again at verses 1 through 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Notice that it was after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And notice further what the author Matthew gives to indicate the context of time. It was in the days of Herod the king. And this makes sense as the ancient world often marked their time periods by the reigns of certain kings. Do you realize that that is even the case for our dating system? Our, our dating, dating system, system is based, based upon, upon the reign of a king. king. Don't listen to this whole CE current era garbage. It's based upon Anno Domini, Domini meaning dominion, the reign of our Lord, 2023. We mark times and seasons by the reigns of kings. Now, before we move on from this, we need to understand who Herod was. He reigned from 37 BC to 4 BC. He was known as Herod the Great because of his leading of a conquest of the area known as Palestine or Israel with a Roman army. And his many uh, great and bold building projects gave him a name that lasted. But all the while, he was actually only a puppet king of the true power in Rome. And this is really the case for any earthly power, is it not? The earthly powers are all puppet kings. We have looked at this in the past, that any earthly lordship is ruling in part by the actual power of the kingdom of darkness and the power of Satan. God still uses them in his providence, as we have seen in scripture, because he has power over Satan, but they're under the allowed domain of darkness. All earthly rulers in that manner are puppets. And this shows up well in Herod's life. While his construction acumen was great, His relationships were a mess. Upon assuming the throne in Jerusalem, Herod exiled his first wife and married a woman that was in the lineage of the ruling religious class of Jerusalem. He was a practicing Jew, but his actions showed no reverence to the law of God at all. He was simply hungry for power. 
And so Matthew notes that he was the king at the time of Jesus's birth, which we can now understand was more likely around 6 or 7 BC. 6 or 7 BC, as his reign, Herod's reign, ended in about 4 BC. And specifically, Herod was king over the land previously known as Israel. In other words, he was the Roman puppet king that could call himself ruler or king of the Jews. He was, in his mind, king of the Jews. And that is why Matthew's next comment is such an interesting one. As Herod sat enthroned, he was approached by wise men, probably holding court, if you will, wise men from the east who had come to find what? Notice it. The king of the Jews. Matthew's wording is very particular here. For Herod had been handed the kingdom out of the actual power of Rome. In other words, he would never have rightful power over it. They could renege at any point in time. For it was out of the succession of Roman emperors that he gained his power, not his own lineage. But the wise men from the east come, and they have the audacity to ask the governmental, political king of the Jews for the whereabouts of the one born king of the Jews. You see, this child ruler they are insinuating had the right to the throne based on his lineage of royal blood. Now just pause for a moment and look back to the chapter before. What is the whole chapter in chapter one about? Genealogy and lineage. Look at Matthew 1.1, just for example. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now this was a twofold lineage that was a slap across the face of Herod. First, the lineage of Abraham. Jesus was an ethnic Jew in the truest sense of the world. Herod, however, was not fully ethnically Jewish. He was the son of an Edomite father and a Jewish mother, Edomite being one of the greatest enemies of Israel. And while his ancestors had been practicing Jews for a few generations, he was seen as only partially Jewish, which if you know the Bible well, well at all, uh, there was no such thing. In fact, he was what was called an Idumean, which is Latin for Edomite. And so no self-respecting, full-blooded Jewish leader would ever recognize the validity of his claim to the throne. It would be akin to our day, a person who is for Donald Trump and their view of Biden. You're not my president, right? That's how they view him. But Jesus was fully Jewish. He was the heir of the Abrahamic covenant and promise. And not only that, Jesus was also in the lineage of King David. David, the man appointed by the God of the Jews himself as the rightful king of Israel. Was Herod in that lineage? Not at all. Now think about the roles of heredity and lineage in terms of claiming the throne in those days. This was all pretty important stuff for Herod to understand and know in order to hold on to his throne. And so these wise men, maybe even without meaning to, are doing two things. First, they are calling into question the role he has as a ruler. Imagine going up to the president of the United States at their inauguration and saying, so where's the guy that actually won the vote? <laughs> Things would get a bit tense quickly, wouldn't they? And secondly, these wise men are pointing out that there is one who has a rightful claim on the throne, unlike Herod, that could usurp it from him and remove any and all power that he has. They're saying that Jesus, metaphorically and literally, is the rising star that will take authority over the kingdom. And they are coming to worship him. And they're simply asking Herod for directions. Now, why would these wise men come from the east to worship this Jewish Messiah? Well, most likely they came from the land of Babylon. They were possibly even priests in some weird mix of Zoroastrianism and Judaism. And they saw an astrological singularity that caused them to believe that the Jewish Messiah had arrived. Now, after all, there were many Jewish converts that lived in this area as a result of the Babylonian captivity, and many of the Jewish traditions and prophecies still probably circulated there, one of which was the blessing of Balaam in the story of Numbers 24 that was seen prophetically. In Numbers 24, 17, Balaam said this, I see him, meaning the one who will come, the king to come for Israel, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter, 
which is what a king holds, power, authority, reign, shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and bring down all the sons of Sheth. It was this prophecy, many believe, that was the prophecy these wise men were dependent upon. And this was the sign they were using to proclaim the coming of the Jewish Messiah, and they were coming to worship him. The word here for worship is proskunuo, which means to bow down in reverence and adoration to a ruler. The rightful ruler of the throne of God's people had come, and his name was Jesus of Nazareth, and he was indeed the anointed king. This good news of a new king coming to bring peace to the world has now been declared by the mouths of Gentile foreigners. And if you know anything about the Old Testament prophecies, for the truth of the Messiah to come out of the mouths of Gentiles was actually condemnation for the Jewish people. It's interesting, isn't it, that the first evangelists that Matthew notes were Gentiles coming to tell the Jewish leaders that the Messiah was among them. Matthew then paints three different responses to this collision between these two kingdoms. The first is the troubled heart of false religion. The troubled heart of false religion. Herod, being the reigning king of this same dominion, is rightfully troubled about the prospect of a more rightful heir to the throne usurping his power. And we'll come back to this in a moment. But let's first look and see what his actions are. Read again with me in verses 3 through 6. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it was written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Herod had intense distress at this prospect of someone taking his throne. Makes sense. But look at who else was distressed. It says, all Jerusalem with him. And we know who this is specifically referring to because of the next line, assembling all the chief priests and scribes of, excuse me, of the people. This group that was also experiencing intense distress was the religious leaders of the Jews at the time, the ruling elite over the supposedly theocratic people of Yahweh. But let's think for a minute and ask, why were they distressed? What was the news that had come to them? After all, shouldn't the religious leaders be a group that is longing for the coming of the Messiah? I mean, I don't know about you, but if I heard that Jesus showed up over at Cannon Beach, I'd probably get in my car and I'd go, right? Shouldn't they be jumping for joy that these wise men have come from the east with an express message that Christ was here to save the Jewish people? As we'll see in a minute, this infant that exists fulfills at bare minimum the requirement for where the Messiah was to be born. At the very least, shouldn't they say, wait a minute. That's pretty interesting. Let's go with the wise men to see if this is true, and then maybe we can worship him as well. Maybe our prayers have been answered. But that's not the reaction. Herod assembles all of these people, and rather than these leaders being against Herod and excited about the possibility that they might be able to reject him and eject him from the throne, they seem to align with him in their distress. In their distress, he says to them, Quick, tell me where this anointed king, this usurping ruler, is to be born. And so they quote to him the passage of Micah 5.2. Micah 5.2 says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Now, this obviously gives the information of where the Christ will be born, but notice the repeated word in Matthew's quotation of Micah 5.2. He uses the word ruler in quick succession. Matthew is writing it this way because he's trying to emphasize that this person, this anointed king, would be the ruler over any other authority, including that of political authority like Herod and religious authority like these false leaders. If we compare the two, the direct quote, from Micah, and then Matthew's use of it, we can see what Matthew is trying to do in his use of these literary tools. Matthew has adjusted a couple of other things from this original as well. 
First, as we noted, he doubled up on the word ruler. But this is also interesting because he may be intending to give a nod to an earlier prophecy, an earlier prophecy from Genesis 49. It says this, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him. Tribute meaning gifts. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. This prophecy out of the mouth of Joseph comes as a statement at the end of Genesis that the ultimate ruler, the one who will crush the head of Satan and defeat the enemies of God's people and will rule over God's people, will come from the tribe of Judah. And so this infant is not just a threat to Herod's rule, but also to the religious leaders. For the Christ's rule will render useless any ceremonial or cultic practices that were then in place. For these religious leaders, they realized that this child that's quoted of in Micah 5.2, this child that's born as the Messiah would be the end of their power over the people. He would be the end of the sacrificial system from which they have been embezzling, and it would be the end of their position of authority. And so they wanted to fight it. They wanted to hold on to their ability to control their standing with God and stand between the people and their God. And to put salt in the wound, Matthew also adds in this title of shepherd. You see the word shepherd in Matthew's use of it, but not in Micah's. And he does this to describe the coming Messiah and at the same time make commentary on the current religious leaders. For generations by this point, Israelite religious leaders had become well acquainted with this word shepherd, this title used by God as a criticism of themselves. In the book of Ezekiel, for example, God speaks through the prophet to tell them that they are horrible shepherds that have been feeding on the sheep rather than protecting them, abusing them rather than leading them. And so to remedy the situation, God promises that he will not leave his sheep in the hands of false religious leaders that are actually leading the people into the jaws of the enemy. Instead, he himself will become the shepherd that leads them. And this is from Ezekiel 34, 12 through 15. I've just quoted the ends of it here so you can get the gist of it. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. In using this wording as an adjustment to the prophecy of Micah, Matthew is intentionally making clear that this child who has been born a ruler is indeed the Messiah. Matthew is commenting that these leaders knew that this was the one to come who would be Messiah, and yet, without even looking into it, they aligned with Herod and worried that their authority and power would be removed. They were distressed, Matthew says. As those who have been Christians for a while, or at bare minimum, have been around the church, this sounds a bit like our own hearts sometimes, doesn't it? When presented with the truth that Jesus is Lord of your life in full, or not at all, we recoil. We have great distress at the fact that he's here amongst us and he wants to reign. For the dead, false, works-based, and apathetic religion we propped up must be destroyed if Christ is to be king. It must be replaced with an allegiance to Christ that spans our entire life and delves to the deepest part of our hearts. For those of us who like to exist in an apathetic religion where we pick and choose what we want to follow, When we are confronted with Christ as king, we realize we can no longer fake a walk with Christ. And for those of us who like to exist in a works-based religion, when we are confronted with the truth that Christ is king, we realize that we can no longer control the outcome of our salvation. Either way, we are in distress because of our false religion. And because we realize we must bow down to Christ as Lord rather than continue to try and manipulate or form a religion in our own image. And that thought scares us to death. But the answer that brings peace and joy is in doing just that. It's in admitting that our religion has been false 
And our allegiance has actually not been to Christ, but to an idol made in our own image. And we must destroy it at all costs. But we know we can't unless Christ first does that. Friends, if this resonates with you at all this morning, I pray that you would spend the remainder of this Advent season laying your heart down before Christ and asking him to break any part of a false religion in your life so that he might actually reign as king. We see this first response to the colliding kingdoms and the religious leaders, but then we also see Herod's response. And what we see here is the deceit of a deposed Lord. The deceit of a deposed Lord. Herod is in bitter distress. He knows that if there is one who has been born as the rightful heir, his days upon the throne are numbered. And so he asks the religious leaders to see if there is any validity in this possible claim. And once they agree that this is unnerving to their respective circles of authority, he takes a second step. He quietly summons the wise men to come and talk with him. He would in no way want to draw attention to the possibility that the Messiah had come. He knew that if the common people got wind of this, they would raise up this person as their leader, as the one who could finally break them free of Herod's Roman oppression. Herod knew that he would have a rebellion on his hands. And so the first question he asks then is when the, first, uh, when the star first appeared. He knew that it had been a while, for the journey itself from the homeland of these wise men would have been a massive undertaking. It would have taken them nine months at minimum for them to traverse afar the distance between their land and Jerusalem. A few verses later in the story, we're given an understanding of that time period in Matthew 2.16. Would you look there with me? Matthew 2.16, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. And so they stated to him that it would have come about two years prior. And this is how we know that Jesus was an infant at this point in the story, and we are long past the manger scene of Jesus' birth. And yet, as I said, this still gives commentary on what occurred there. And so Herod sends them on their way, convincing them to let him know where the child is when they find him. Now, why would he want to do this? Does he too, does Herod too, want to go and worship the Christ child, give up his throne in homage voluntarily, and bow down to the infant king? No, not at all. The verse we just looked at in verse 16 tells us so. He wanted to know where he could find Jesus so that he could murder him. Unfortunately, this was a common practice in ancient times when one who had a more legitimate claim to the throne arose. The only solution for the throne's competitor, other than voluntarily giving up the throne, was to eliminate the competition. And this was also, by the way, normal practice for Herod the Great. Towards the end of his life, within view of his impending death, he was almost done. He had multiple of his own children executed, as well as his ex-wife, because he didn't want them taking his throne. This Herod was a horrifically demonic ruler. One might say he was even demonically possessed. So then why did Herod lie here? Why did he say that he wanted to come and worship this infant king? Wouldn't it have been obvious to the wise men that he was lying? After all, they were supposed to be wise, weren't they? Well, let's think about this. These wise men were Gentiles by Jewish standards. They may have had some strain of Jewish ethnicity in them. They may have even been practicing Jews in some capacity, but they were Gentiles by Jewish standards. And yet, they had traveled so far to worship at the feet of the one that would become their Messiah. They were converts to the reign of the Jewish Messiah. So it, is it such a stretch then to believe that Herod, a practicing Jew, an Idumean that is half Jewish by ethnicity, would also want to worship with them? Not at all. Perhaps he too, they might have thought, is converted at heart. But we know his true intentions because of what comes next. This demonic and evil ruler that personifies the adversary of God sends soldiers to this small town south of Jerusalem. He sends them to commit genocide and murder 
against any infant that was two years or younger. Friends, I know you want to push this out of your thoughts, but when we go out to get our kids, I want you to think about this Christmas story and understand what was truly going on when Jesus invaded earth. The backlash was horrifically demonic. Think about the horror of this mass murder. Why on earth would Herod do this? Why would he massacre innocence and righteousness? Because he wanted to hold on and control with power. He wanted to continue being king. Perhaps this strikes a chord with us today. Perhaps this is what your response is when confronted with the truth that Christ is Lord and you are not. To a certain extent, I know I'm speaking to the choir here. Maybe there's those who will listen later who are not here amongst us this morning, who are not here amongst us because they want to be Lord. You and I might lie to ourselves that we want to come and worship Jesus as Lord too, but then in the deep recesses of our hearts and in our actions and when there's accountability to others, we violently rage in response. We are willing to destroy friendships and block people who love love us, us, ghost ghost those those who have made a covenant covenant with us, and destroy the very light that Christ has shed upon our hearts by his word, just so we can maintain control of our dominion in sin. Perhaps the false religion that sits in our hearts has gone so deep that it has turned into a self-proclaimed lie that we actually want to surrender to Jesus, but the truth is actually the exact opposite. And friends, we know it by our life. If that is you today, today is the day to admit that you are a rebel against Christ. You're a rebel against his people. Admit that you have wanted to maintain lordship over Christ and his word and his people, and you have done anything to protect your sin. And beg for Christ's forgiveness and empowerment to repent from this lie. Friends, this is far more of us than we care to admit. You see, every Advent season, more so than maybe even the rest of the year, we come face to face with the truth of the gospel. The truth of the good news that light has dawned on a world enslaved in darkness and sin. Christ has come to die in our place, shed his blood for our sins upon the cross, grant us forgiveness from that rebellion, and show us victory over our sin by his resurrection. And then he poured out his spirit that we might be drawn into his kingdom to worship him forever. Friends, this is the meaning of Christmas. But whenever we come face to face with this gospel truth, our old nature that desires to rule over all recognizes that it, like Herod, is a deposed Lord whose time is short. And so that fleshly heart will rage against the new ruler, desiring to destroy anything and everything around us so that we might reign supreme. Our sinful heart has a scorched earth campaign. Our sin, our desire to be Lord is as deep and dark and demonic as Herod's. Maybe not because of the genocide that occurred that night in Bethlehem, but because of the murder that occurred on the cross of Calvary over three decades later. For there, my sin and your sin, our sin nature joined with the crowds that are foreshadowed in this story in Matthew And cried out, crucify him, crucify him, for we will not have this man reign over us. Friend, if you've been lying to yourself that Christ is your Lord, today Christ is calling you to be honest in your rebellion and to finally bow down to him as your truthful Lord and King. I pray that we would respond. I pray that each of us in humble submission would fall flat on our face and respond. And that is the third response we see in our text, a glorious response, the joyful worship of rejoicing subjects, the joyful worship of rejoicing subjects. 
Let's read verses 9 through 12 again there in Matthew 2. <clears throat> After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to the rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. These three wise men leave Herod's presence. We don't even necessarily know that it's three. I don't know why I keep saying that. I'm foreshadowing the song we're going to sing a bit. They leave Herod's presence and find that the star comes to rest over uh, the home of the Christ child. We don't know what this star was. It could have been a celestial event that was far and away different from anything we know. It could have been an angel that appeared to them and drew them. The idiomatic use of the word star here could portray that in the original language. Whatever it was, it was miraculous. And the wise men followed its miraculous appearance and came to find this infant. And it says that they first rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They saw the star, the light that illuminated to them the way to the one they came to worship was cause for exceedingly great joy. And when they entered the house, they saw the child and they knew by way of the illuminating star that this was the Messiah. And so they did what you do when you come before a conquering king. They fell down and prostrated themselves. They fell down on their face and they worshiped. The word translated here, worshiped again, is that same word from earlier. They're declaring their allegiance to the small child as king and deity. Friends, imagine it. If we went and grabbed one of our children, one of our two-year-olds, brought him here on stage and we all fell down in worship, it would be odd and yet amazing. Because unlike our children, this was God incarnate. This was the God that formed the universe. And yet he stepped into it as an infant, as a baby. And so they're declaring their allegiance to the small child as king and deity. The world similarly would look at us and think, what a weird group of people. They're just reading a book and yet they respond with raised hands and singing voices and tears and joy in their hearts. Well, friends, we have seen the star. We have the word of God illuminating the way to the one who is our savior. So every moment that we engage with the word of God, we should have worship that responds the same way as these wise men. Exceedingly great joy, for without the word of God, we would be in darkness and just as demonic as Herod. So they worship this child as king and deity. These are dignitaries from an eastern country who in that country are seen as the wisest counsel for the ruling king. Like Joseph in Egypt or Daniel in Babylon, they hold a place of authority higher than all but the singular ruling king. In fact, they are considered kings themselves. And yet when these grown men, probably in full regalia, when they see the truth illuminated by the star that this child is the one born as the legitimate ruler of God's chosen people, they bow down in allegiance. They humble themselves to the one who humbled himself before his own creation. And then they bring forth their gifts. As we saw just a few weeks ago, this is the giving of a tribute to a conquering king to indicate reverence and submission. This is not just Christmas gifts. And this is not the first time that someone from the East has come to declare submission with tribute to a king of Israel. They're following the example of the queen of Sheba when she came to see Solomon. And notice the wording and similarity to our text. It, it might even be true that Matthew was trying to call this to mind. This is from 1 Kings 10, 9 through 10. The queen of Sheba says to Solomon, Blessed be the Lord your God who is delighted in you, and set you on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. He has made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. If this was true for Solomon, how much more true is this true for Jesus? Then she gave the king 120 talents of gold and a very great quantity of spices and precious stones. 
Never again came such an abundance of spices as these that the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. You see, in bringing this form of worship and gifts of tribute, Matthew is declaring that Jesus, upon his birth, became the Messiah that even the Gentiles were hoping for. Solomon himself knew that this king, the king in Matthew, would be a greater king than even himself, and he desired that this God-made flesh would be given more reverence than he had ever received. And so he wrote this in Psalm 72, 11, May all kings bow down before him. All nations serve him. Long may he live. May gold of Sheba be given to him. May prayer be made for him continually and blessings invoked for him all the day. Solomon knew that there would be a greater king. And Solomon wasn't the only prophet that declared this. We read this earlier in Isaiah. Would you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 60? Mark read some of this earlier. Sixty verse one. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you, and nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense, and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. These promises of God to his people were completely fulfilled in this baby born as the Christ. All of the hope of Israel, all of the hope of the world was fulfilled in this Christ child. In fulfillment of these very texts, the author of the Christmas hymn, We Three Kings, declared the worship of Christ fulfilled. Friends, listen to these lyrics that we'll sing in a bit. Born a king on Bethlehem's plain, gold I bring to crown him again. King forever, ceasing never, over us all to reign. Myrrh is mine, its bitter perfume breathes, a life of gathering gloom. Sorrow, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone-cold tomb. Glorious now, behold him arise, King and God and sacrifice. Alleluia, alleluia. Heaven to earth replies. In this moment in Matthew, these wise men, these magi, these Gentile kings humble themselves, give reverence and tribute, and declare the good news. The good news that Jesus is Lord. The good news that Jesus rules. The good news that Jesus is king. These first Gentile converts declare with their joyful worship that they are rejoicing subjects of this anointed king of God's people. Now, friends, we are so confused about the gospel that I have actually read before people doubting whether or not these men were converts under the reign of the Messiah. Because bowing down in humble worship is not enough for the Lord. Our confused view of the gospel has removed the idea that Jesus is Lord because we've made it so much about us. And we do the very same thing at Christmas. For it is not about us. 
It's about the fact that God invaded demonic earth to bring redemption and forgiveness of sins, to give hope to his people, and the truth that he is covenantally faithful to everyone he has promised his redemption. That's what Christmas is. This Advent, this Christmas, we should follow the lead of these wise men. For in the moment of Christ's birth, all the people of God, exiled to the Gentile world, received hope that we would be drawn back to our King by the illuminating miracle of God's direction. And because of the birth of Christ, all of us who are lost and dying in our sin can now know that our King has come and that He will come again because he is still just as faithful as he was in that day. Our times are now forever marked by his reign over his people 2,000 years later. The current era is marked by the reign of our Lord. And we can know by the birth of Christ that he will draw us near and shine light in the darkness of our sin to redeem us and make us his own, to make us new so that we too, with every moment of our life, can give him tribute and worship that he deserves. And this Christmas, we rejoice because our Lord has come. We as Gentiles are now able to enter the throne room of God that was previously denied to anyone outside of the Jewish people. We can now be saved from our sin of rebellion and instead turn to him in prostrate worship. We can offer the very gift of our lives to declare that he is indeed our king. And so this morning, as we sing these songs, as we give praise to him, let these wise men be our example and model. May the Holy Spirit give us insight this morning into which of the responses is natural to our hearts when we're confronted with the truth of Jesus as king of our lives. And if one of our responses is either of the first two, may the Holy Spirit give us conviction and change our hearts so that we can repent in the depth of our hearts to turn and worship Jesus with the joyful worship of rejoicing subjects. Let's be those rejoicing subjects. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.